stress, fear, depression, spiritual warfare. Are you weighted down? Do you need refreshing? Welcome, welcome everyone to the Warriors for Christ podcast, where we seek to uplift, edify, and encourage you to be light and salt in a dark and tasteless world with your host, Kyle. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Warriors for Christ podcast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Sam. And we are delighted that you are here with us, folks. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. And uh, Brother Sam, got to ask, what's the Lord put on your heart for us to get into in this episode? Well, Kyle, today we're going to look at some warnings from God. You know, God warns us about not being deceived and warnings of many other things. Well, what are those things? There's actually quite a bit. Today, we're going to go through in the Bible, and one of the biggest warnings and the things that God cautions us to be weary of is the deception against false Christians and their false teaching. Kyle, there are so many warnings of that. That is the biggest threat to the church, and yet most people don't know that most of the people in the church are false. It's It's the many, not the few, that are deceived. It's the few who will be saved, not the many. So we're going to go through and look at passages of that, of what God says. Uh, The other things that we're also going to look that God talks about is God warns about sin and the deception of sin, and that sin deceives and sin destroys. You can't still have sin. Uh, we'll, We'll also look at the warnings against the riches of the world, the deception that it creates and can cause you to perish as well as riches and other pleasures, and we're going to let God's Word instruct us. So that's what we're going to look at today, Kyle. Great. Well, with that, I'll open us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our needs. We thank you, Lord, especially that all those needs are met through Christ. Father, we thank you for your Spirit, and we thank you for this time together. We pray, O Lord God, for everyone that's listening that today they get to hear the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth, O Lord. We thank you and ask you to be with us and and instruct us and teach us each and every second of the way. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 7. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, it's going to start off, and it's going to talk about the wide gate and the narrow gate. And it's not just a wide gate and a narrow gate, Kyle. We're going to find out that there's something behind the gate. There's a way. There's a path. There's a wide path that allows many crooked paths to go on it, and then there's a straight and narrow path behind the gate. We're going to find out if it's a wide gate that goes to heaven, or if it's the wide gate that goes to destruction. And as we look through it, we're going to find out the people he's addressing on those who go through these gates are those who call him Lord. In Luke, when it discusses the same parable, it's those who seek him. And we're going to find out what some of the deception is that causes people to go down the wrong path or to be deceived and not reckon themselves and understand that they're on the wrong path. So Kyle, if you will read Matthew chapter 7, we'll start with verse 13 through 14. Enter ye in by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many are they that enter in thereby, for narrow is the gate and straightened the way that leadeth unto life, and few are they that find it. Yeah, so again, we have a wide gate that leads to destruction and a wide path. And there's a narrow gate and a narrow path that leads to life, but there's few that find it. There's a gate and there's a path. Now, people who've listened to other podcasts and we've talked about the grace of God and what it is, what it does, you'll understand that first you have to receive through faith the gift of God, the Holy Spirit. That's entering through the narrow gate. And that's by faith. That's right. There's and nothing anyone can do to earn. It's all by faith. Faith and humility and surrender. But then once someone receives the Holy Spirit of God or the grace of God through faith, they're changed into a new creation. Amen. They now walk a new and an impossible life. They're able to be holy as God is holy in all their behavior. They're able to walk as God is light in all they're walking. They're able 
to live a life just like Christ. They're to have a pure heart and be pure just as Christ. Well, that's the narrow path, Kyle, but that's not man's effort. That's God's effort. It's the proof of the faith of the fullness of the deity of God now dwelling in them. The same spirit that did the work in Christ is to do the same work in them. Amen. They now are to be a holy and living sacrifice, living their life blameless, improving the will of God, all that is good, acceptable, and perfect, the will of God in accordance with the, what the Word of God says. But people don't understand these things because they're being taught by the deceptive teachers. The false prophets. So as we keep reading here in Matthew chapter 7... He then warns them of who? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. So what do they look like, Kyle? Do they look like wolves? No, they look like sheep. Oh, they look like sheep. Yeah, they're wearing sheep's clothing. They look like other Christians. God says, beware of these people. They're false. They're false. These aren't... And, and even that, Kyle, it's not just people in the church. No, you see, these are the leaders of the church. The prophets were the leader, the leader of the people of God. Mm -hmm. Remember Samuel, the prophet, Jeremiah, the, the, the people that God sent to lead the people. That's right. But these are false prophets, false leaders. Now, obviously, you're going to have many false sheep that follow the false leader. Unfortunately, it's not a small problem, Kyle. It's a big one. It is a very big problem. So as we keep looking, how does it say we're going to know these false prophets? Is it, what does it say? By their fruits you shall know them. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but the corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Kyle, can a good tree produce bad fruit? It cannot. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So a good tree, in verse 18, cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. What happens, Kyle, to a tree that doesn't bear good fruit, in verse 19? Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So it's cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, Kyle, someone recently asked a question, and they said, well, what do you say is good fruit? Because... I think I have good fruit. I was like, well, God answers that question for us. He answers specifically Jesus and his teachings, both in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We did an episode on this, and God requires a new heart, part one, New Testament episode. Now, some people may look at that episode and say, yeah, that's long. I, I don't want to listen to that whole thing. Well, you're in luck. All those passages and the teachings that we talk about, like in the first 15 minutes or so, uh, we cover with what Jesus said of what's defined as what the good tree and the bad tree is. <clears throat> you see, Jesus said that the good tree is someone that has a good heart, when you read all those passages. The bad tree is somebody who has a bad heart. The good heart produces good fruit. The bad heart produces bad fruit. And it actually says, out of the mouth will proceed forth that which comes from the heart. If your mouth, if you can't bridle your tongue, as it says in James chapter 1, verse, I think it's 26, it says your religion is worthless. And most people say, okay, but I don't, I don't always have bad things coming out of my mouth. Well, it doesn't matter. You see, the Bible says sinners can agape love sinners. That doesn't mean that they have the love of God. They're able to love other people, but not with a perfect love. You see, it's with a corrupt love. People say, well, I do good. Well, the problem is your good is corrupt. It has a bad heart. You're a bad tree. If you're a bad tree or you have a bad heart, how can you also ever possibly think that you could produce good fruit? You can't. Clearly, The Bible says a bad tree only produces bad fruit. So the problem is how people are defining it. Um, they think they're good. Now, what God says defiles the bad heart of what makes it defiled is the wicked Thoughts. That's right. The thoughts and intentions. Of the, the thoughts. Yep. So I ask people, do you, ever, do you ever have thoughts of the anger of man? Do you ever have thoughts of lust or unholy or impure desires? Do you ever have thoughts of worry? Do you ever have thoughts of bitterness? Thoughts of jealousy? Thoughts of envy? Thoughts of strife? Well, the problem is that defiles your heart. That is the sin that's in you because your heart hasn't been cleansed. You haven't received a new heart. Now, when you're starting listening to that, you're probably thinking, well, that's impossible then. Good. That means you're listening to the word of God clearly. 
That's right. It's impo- it's an impossible work that only God can do. Amen. Now, if you don't understand, listen to the episode we did on the new heart, part one and part two. Listen to what we talked about, what grace is and what it does, the true grace of God that we're to stand firm in. Listen to the episode that we did of what it actually means to truly be a righteous man, as God defines a righteous person. And if you're willing to humble yourself, then I guarantee you, you will find the truth. So that's something to point out here. That's how we know. It's not what people say. As we find out later as we go through, we're going to find out many other people proclaim the name of Christ. They preach Christ, but not in truth. They preach a gospel, but they distort it. So we got to be careful. And again, the devil preaches the word of God, just not all of it. That's right. So as we keep going here, people we find out are going to confess Jesus is Lord. Now, people are probably thinking, oh, but Romans 10, 10, uh, 8 and 9, or 10, 10, 9 and 10. Um, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. Well, they don't know the context of that. They don't know the whole chapter 10. They don't know verse 10, what the result of, with the heart a person believes, result in righteousness. They don't know what that means because they don't, they don't know what, how God already defined what that meant in chapter 6, which is somebody who's actually been spiritually baptized, which is another big thing. It's way beyond water baptism. People are water baptized in the name of Jesus. That doesn't mean anything if you aren't spiritually baptized in the name of Jesus. Amen. But they don't understand the truth. And, and we talk about that in, um, uh, I think, uh, believe. We said believe, you must believe and receive the Holy Spirit. We talked about that in that, that episode. Yeah. So here, what's the problem? I mean, people confess Jesus as Lord, but what does he say the problem is? Therefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. The one who's doing the will of the Father. You see, got to be doing the will of the Father. The will of the Father isn't to commit sin. It's to bear spiritual fruit, good fruit. Now, he keeps saying, uh, again, what will people say? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy by thy name, and by thy name cast out demons, and by thy name do many mighty works? Now, Kyle, that sounds like good fruit. But, you know, the problem is, as God says, if you have a defiled heart, everything you touch is defiled, nothing is holy, and God rejects the entire sacrifice because it's defiled. You have to have a new heart. So what does he say the problem was, Kyle? In verse 23, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. They still worked sin. They still had sin. It wasn't because they didn't confess Jesus as Lord. It wasn't because they didn't believe in following. They confessed him as Lord. They believed they were doing works of God. What was the problem? The problem was the sin. They had not been sanctified. Now, some people think, oh, but that's a process. Well, it may be a process to go from an infant who doesn't have the Spirit of God to the point of when you are sanctified, the event, being born again. We've covered that in the book of Galatians, but and also in the episode, sanctification is an event, not a process. That's right. All right, let's, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 24. And what does he tell us in verse 10 through 13? 10 through 13. And then shall many stumble, and shall deliver up one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall lead many astray. And because iniquity shall be multiplied, the love of the many shall wax cold. But he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. So the problem is, again, there's going to be many false prophets, these false teachers. Mm -hmm. Leading many astray. They're going to lead many astray. They're going to stumble and deliver one another and hate one another. Yep. And then again, and we've covered this one about, you know, the once saved, always saved uh, episode that we did. It's only the one who endures the end that will be saved. That's right. Now, also, when you keep reading in verse 24, again, what does he say about warning? Verse 24, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. That's right. So we're told in advance these things. Again, there's a deception that's going to be working from the beginning until the end. We have to be aware of these things. We have to be on guard. Now, if we turn over to Mark chapter 13... Kyle, if you can read verse 22 and 23. Yes. 
For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show signs and wonders that they may lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take he- take ye heed. Behold, I have told you all things beforehand. Yep. So again, it, it's it's a consistent warning. He tells us again. Uh, when you flip over to, we're going to go to the book of Acts, chapter 20. And in Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 28 to 30, Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit hath made you bishops, to feed the church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. That's right. So he tells them they got to be on their guard. They got to be alert. And when he says, he's going to say these savage wolves are going to come in. They are not going to spare the flock. Now, we kind of read about that earlier. Jesus warned against that. Here again, we have a warning in Scripture. Does he say they're going to come from the outside? Where does he say the wolves are going to come from? Wolves shall enter in among you. I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves shall men arise. So it's clearly among they're going to enter in among you, and among your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. They're going to draw away disciples after them. This isn't something where they're going to be identified and it's like, oh, look, there they are. No, people are actually going to follow them because they're going to think they are the true ones. And it's not a small problem, Kyle. It's huge. It's it's a massive problem. It's a massive problem. In Romans chapter 16, some more warnings. And a lot of times you find these warnings at the back of the book. Truth has been spoken, truth has been taught, admonishments have been given in the book, and then you have the warning at the end. So in Romans chapter 16, what does verse 17 and verse 18 say? Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them that are causing the divisions and occasions of a stumbling, contrary to the doctrine which ye learned, and turn away from them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Christ, but their own belly, and by their smooth and fair speech, they beguile the hearts of the innocent. That's right. They beguile the hearts of the innocent. They deceive the hearts of the innocent. So there's people who aren't on their guard, they're in their own sincerity, seeking God, and they're being deceived in their heart. Now, he tells them, you have to watch them because they're going to teach things contrary to the teachings which they learned. The, the word that's in this Bible. Now, ironically, Kyle, I will go and I've challenged many pastors. I've gone to other, um, you know, people of the faith who are confident in their faith. And when I challenge them, they say, well, what you're saying is not true. I'll say, okay, please show me and explain to me in scripture. And they'll pull out well, like one verse. And I won't run to a different verse to try to say, oh, well, this verse contradicts you. I'll actually use the very verse that they're using. I'll say, well, let, let's, let's actually look at the full word of God because you're taking that passage out of context. So let's actually understand what that chapter and what that whole book says, and then we'll know truth. You know what they do, Kyle? They don't want to listen. No. They don't want to listen to the Word of God. They want to use one verse of the Word of God to act as if they have confidence because they quoted a verse. But when I say, well, let's dig deeper into the Word of God, we're going to stay on the verse. We're going to stay in that same book. Kyle, they don't want to. As a matter of fact, when I start pointing out other passages in the Bible that contradicts the very blasphemous words that come out of their mouth, they take great offense, and they don't want to listen anymore. Everyone that's listening, if your understanding of the Bible is based upon what someone else has taught you from a pulpit, and God has not taught you from his word, or maybe you rely on man and not the word of God, the word of God is going to prick your heart and make you wake up. That's when you cry out to God, and you ask him by his Holy Spirit to open your eyes to see all the truth in the Bible and not these fractional verses that the deceitful workers of the devil who claim to be servants of God, now in their mind, they have sincere uh, intentions, but they're corrupt. They're corrupt. They're intentions of the world, not of the Spirit of God. Doctrines of demons. And we're going to cover that, you know, uh, in Timothy, 2 Timothy, it says, people, they themselves are deceived while they're deceiving others. 
So it's not like they're intentionally, some people aren't like, it's not like they're intentionally trying to see, deceive you. Most of the people who are deceiving don't even know they're deceiving. Kyle, like I said, I used to be uh, somebody who led other men and, and that. And Kyle, I was deceived. I didn't know I was deceived. Same here. I was so blind. I mean, today I look back, I'm like, how was I so blind? How was I so dull of hearing? H how was I so completely wrong? I can't even, it just, some, I can't fathom it. Because I didn't, I truly didn't understand what it meant to be in darkness. And yet I thought I was in light. And Jesus says, oh, woe is that darkness in you. The light that is in you is actually darkness. That was me, Kyle. I hear you. Second Corinthians chapter 11. More warnings against these false teachers. Kyle, if you can read verse 12 to 15. But what I do, that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them that desire an occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, fashioning themselves into apostles of Christ. And, to, and no marvel, for even Satan fashioneth himself into an angel of light. Yep, in verse 15. It is no great thing, therefore, if his ministers also fashion themselves as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Right, so here Paul's saying he has to cut off opportunity from these people, these other people that, that are to be regarded as true servants of God, God true teachers of, of Christ. And Paul's like, no, no, they are not. They are not the same as us. They are not the same. And Paul has to plead with the Corinthian church to stop being deceived. He says these people are false apostles. Now, look at that, false apostles. Now, th there were more than just the 12 apostles, Kyle. Apostleship is a gift. It's a gift of the Spirit. And as you go through and you read the Bible, it talks about other apostles. Uh, but people don't know those things, too. They think, oh, there's only 12 apostles. There's no more apostles. Sorry, that's not what the Bible talks about. If And, and also, when you look at the case of, well, if there were only 12 apostles and everybody knew that there were only 12 and a, the gift of apostleship stopped being given, well, then how could there ever be such a thing as a false apostle if, by definition, it was only the 12? You know, and that's other things. It's just the foolishness of people that come up with. Um, but they were false apostles. They were deceitful workers. They disguised themselves as apostles of Christ. The people didn't know it. Again, it's a deception. And the deception, Kyle, does this say they're disguising themselves, going around? Or they aren't these people that says, hey, the people that are going to try to lead you astray are people or are going to persecute you are these Satan worshipers. No, it doesn't say that. It says... They're disguised as apostles of Christ. That's what they're going to look like to you. They're going to speak that way. They're going to sound that way. They're going to feel that way. They're going to look that way. People need to wake up, Kyle. They don't understand the danger of how much Satan and deception has infiltrated the church, and yet it was all prophesied. His servants disguised themselves as servants of righteousness. You know, they at least understand that... God requires a holy living. Even the devil knows that. And, and those who are being deceived, they attempt to. That's why they try to live a godly life. That's why they're always saying, oh, no, it's not by works. It's not by works. But, but you can't really live that way. You know, they even know that you, you got to at least try. But then they say, but, but, but it's not supposed to be trying. It's by faith. It's like, well, why are you telling people to try? Why are you trying, telling people to live different? You see, if you have the power of God, it changes you, Kyle. That's right. There, there is no trying. There's not, you should it's do this. It's not an effort. It's an easy yoke. It's, you do it. It's, it's, it's just, right. You do it. It's, it's, God changes you from the inside. Amen. You're changed forever. And yet people say, you mean you never have these thoughts? No, I don't. The, those thoughts are the defiled tree. You're still the defiled tree. I am not. I said, well, you admit it yourself. Why, why do you resist the Word of God and resist the Holy Spirit? I see light around me. Well, yeah, God's always shining light. Just because you're still in darkness and you see light around you, don't be deceived and think that the light's coming from you. It's a light coming from God trying to shine on your dark life, convicting you of the sin, making you feel guilty. That's the Spirit of God. That's not the work of the devil. The devil wants you to be comfortable where you're at, that it's okay to live that way because you can never be changed. That's normal. No, it's not normal. That's the Spirit of God convicting you. That's right. Don't believe the lies, folks. Let's go to Ephesians. Uh, actually, one other passage in 2 Corinthians, uh, verse 26. Again, um, Paul talks about dangers. In journeyings often, in perils of rivers, in perils of robbers, in perils from my countrymen, in perils from the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. That's right. You have all the dangers... 
you know, again, dangers from the Gentiles, th- those are actual people of the world that don't even claim to be of Christ. Um, but then you have dangers from the false brethren, the false Christians. Unfortunately, there's many false Christians. They do the most damage. We're going to find out later, too, when, when it looks at who are those that are, that are killing the true servants of God. It's not the world. Many of it that the warnings are actually against, when you actually read the warnings in the Bible, it's, it's about the false church that's, that's putting them to death, those who claim to be servants of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Now in this one, uh, we just talked about those who actually are being built up as a body of Christ, those who are being added as a member, um, a soul being added. And, and that's, that can only happen when people, in verse 13 of chapter 4, they attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, and to the perfect man. Again, it's an event. To the same measure of stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Amen. Yes, that's the same fullness, same measure, the same person we are to be. Um, and again, that was talked about more so in Ephesians chapter 3. If you want more of the teaching, listen to the episode we did on the book of Ephesians chapter 2 through 5. Now, he then contrasts that and says, as a result, we're no longer to be this other person, this other person who has not been converted to the perfect man, this other person who has not come to the one faith, uh, the other person who has not come to the knowledge of the Son of God because they're still being deceived by all this false teaching, uh, this person that well, they're an infant in Christ. Oh, that's right. But infants don't have the Holy Spirit. So that's of right. course they haven't been perfected. They haven't become the perfect man. They don't have uh, the unity of the one faith. So the person that we are not supposed to be anymore, that we may be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and craftiness after the wiles of error. That's right. All this deceitful scheming and trickery of men. But Kyle, it, the, it's all these false doctrines they keep teaching. They aren't teaching the true doctrines of Christ. They preach a gospel of Christ, but they distort it. They're deceiving. They, they do the work of their father, the devil. The devil will preach the word of God, just not all of it in truth. We learned about the danger of those people who believed in the teaching of Apollos in Acts chapter 18. It says he was fervent in spirit, an eloquent man, learned accurately the things of of Jesus, and he was teaching accurately the things of Christ. And you're like, okay, well, then then what was the problem? Why why weren't people being filled with the Spirit of God and being born again? Oh, because he was only acquainted with the baptism of John. You see, he was preaching Christ, accurately the things of Christ, the things he knew. He said, "You, yo, you have to be baptized in the name of Christ. You can be baptized in the name of Christ. We read that about some people in Acts chapter 8. They were baptized in the name of Jesus, but they still didn't receive the Spirit. And, and these people in Ephesus, uh, the disciples, they hadn't. And you find out about that in um, chapter 19 later when then Paul has to come and correct them. I got, I got a question on that for you. It just came about on this very topic. You know, Why is it, do you think, that so many people who nominally call themselves Christians don't understand what spirit baptism is. Why, why is it? Why do they not understand what that is? Well, Kyle, it's, well, it's because of all the false teaching. It's they're being taught by people who've never experienced. Now, if you ask somebody, do you know what spiritual baptism is? A lot of people actually, oh, oh yeah, I, I do know what that is. And yes, I do have the spirit. You know, the spirit lives in my heart and Christ lives in my heart. I'm like, okay, great. Can you tell me where in the Bible where it teaches about what that is, what happens, what it does, and what the result is? And most of the time, Kyle, it's blank. Yeah. Blank, 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 blank. Because people will, will teach properly, oh, be baptized in the name of Jesus. They'll say, oh, you have to be born again. So they know the buzzwords, they know this, but then they don't know all the teachings. Because when you don't go through all the teachings of God, guess what you're allowed to fill it in with, Kyle? The teachings of men. And you'll say, well, actually, uh, a true Christian is still going to struggle with that. A true Christian does continue to have to confess his sins every day. And then they'll quote other false passages that we'll get to in the book of 1 John, and and it's just deception because they don't know. Well, go read the book of Romans in Romans chapter 6 that explains what it means, and then it gives the examples of contrast in Romans chapter 6 chapter uh, or in chapter 7, but most people go to the contrast and they point out the man who's still the slave of sin, the whole argument that's shown 
what actually causes the get uh, the your death and the man who's still condemned and they point to that man they're so deceived Kyle they point to identify with the man that's still condemned who still does the very thing that he hates and can't do any good proving that sin still lives in his heart and it hasn't been put to death or removed it's a great deception, Kyle. It is a great, 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 great deception. Do you know that every church, my dad was in the Air Force. I probably went to like 20 different churches growing up. Every single church I went to, looking back, didn't know the truth. They taught a lie. Every single one. That we may be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men in craftiness after the wiles of error. That's right. Uh, and then we come, we go on in chapter 4 later, in verse 20 to verse 24. But ye did not so learn Christ, if so be that ye heard him and were taught in him, even as truth is in Jesus, that ye, be, that ye put away as concerning your former manner of life, the old man that waxes corrupt after the lusts of deceit, and that ye be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man, that after God hath been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So again, he's telling people, he's like, you didn't learn Christ in this way. If, if indeed you've heard him, if indeed you've been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus. You see, Jesus walked in the truth. He lived the truth. His life was that living sacrifice. He manifested the light of God in his life, the same that we are to do. You see, that's the truth of God. But people say, oh, no, you can't be like Christ. Maybe only in some ways, but not fully. Sorry, sorry. If you go through and you listen to all the teachings of God, that's a lie. That's right. You haven't heard the truth, just as the truth is in him. You see, the whole truth is your former life, well, you're supposed to have a former life, and we may for, former life, we mean the, the, the man born into the world versus the man who's been born again by the power of God, by all the fullness of God that only does one work in a man's life, only produces one fruit. That man. The old man was corrupted. The lusts of deceit, the sin still lived in the thoughts. You still have that? I don't care how much good you think you do. You're still corrupt. You're no different than the sinner. Sinners still love other sinners. You can still have agape love. You can still do good works in the eyes of man. But you have sinful thoughts. You are defiled. Stop deceiving. That's not the road you want to be on, folks. So the problem, Kyle, is the mind. Their mind. They're still holding on to deceptive teachings. Their mind has to be renewed. And that They have to be renewed, and then they can put on the new self. The new self, which in God is created only in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Amen. And then as you keep going through the book of Ephesians, it says, so, no unwholesome word comes out of mouth. You don't steal anymore. You don't have the anger of man. You don't have any bitterness, wrath, anger, slammer, slander, uh, clamor, malice, none of that. No corrupt no. speech. As a matter of fact, you keep reading, it says you're to walk in love. Uh, you're to be imitators of God and walk just as Christ did. No filthiness, no immorality, uh, no silliness, no none of this stuff. So as you keep reading in Philippians, it then tells you, uh, uh, later it tells you not to be deceived, but we're going to come back to that because that's going to talk about sin and we're going to come in to where it, 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 we're going to go through all those passages. Right now, I just want to focus on the false teaching and, and we'll come back on those later. But yeah, people just don't understand, Kyle. Philippians chap chapter 2, some more deception. Verse 19 to 21. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will care truly for your state. For they all seek their own, not the things of Jesus Christ. That's but, right. But ye know the proof of him that as a child serveth a father, so he served with me in furtherance of the gospel. So here there is a concern in the Philippian church, and so... Paul says, you know, I need to go send Timothy, right, to learn of their condition, to see if they're still standing fast. And he says he had no one else of kindred spirit that he could, that would genuinely be concerned. Because most of the people, again, who proclaim to be Christ, they aren't. Paul's like, nope, I only had Timothy that I could send. Paul knows, people know, there's, there's false people everywhere. They're everywhere. The problem is they seek after their own interests, not of those of Christ Jesus. Now, this is, again, people have to realize much of what the Bible says is how God sees you. 
Just as you go through all those passages in the, the Old Testament, constantly the people of God, Israel, they were convinced, no, no, we're the people of God. No, God is our God. No, we serve God. They would cry out to God for deliverance. They would cry to God when they were being persecuted. And God's like, don't cry to me. I'm not your God. As a matter of fact, I'm the one bringing this on you. I'm the one destroying you because you aren't serving me with a whole heart. You still have a bad heart. You cannot have part of you serving me and still have a bad heart. Amen. So it's when you still have those other interests or those bad thoughts in your heart, you're a bad tree. You are not wholly devoted to God. And Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3, what does he warn against? Wait a second, let me get there. Verses 1 to 3. Mm -hmm. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. <laughs> to write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not irksome, but for you it is safe. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So Paul's repeating this again. He's like, listen, I'm going to write this again to you. So who knows how many times he wrote it before, whatever. But he's like, listen, they're dogs. They're evil workers. They're false circumcision. The false Christians. The false church. He says they're false. They're dogs. They're evil workers. Beware of them. They're going back for their own vomit. He says, we are the true circumcision. We are the true Christian who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ. And yet there's a lot of people say, oh, no, I do, I do worship in the Spirit of God. I do glory in Christ. I said, well, you may think you do, just like many in the people of the Bible. The Bible talks about many people who think they do. But God says, okay, you say you're a, you're a friend of God. God says you're his enemy. You say you follow and you serve God. God says you serve your father, the devil. You say you have peace with God. God says he has a sword to your neck. People are just so blind. They, they won't accept what God has to say about them because in their eyes, in their ways, in their thoughts, they're right and God is wrong. They're so arrogant and prideful of heart, they won't humble themselves. They're unwilling to admit. And they won't look at all the word of God that exposes them because they can't come to, they cannot possibly conceive that they're wrong. Praise God, Kyle. If you and I, if we didn't admit we were wrong, we would have never been changed. I know. We'd still be that Christian that has a desire to serve God. And stumbled. And, stumbled and, enjoyed, and stumbled. I, I enjoyed reading my Bible. I wanted the nearness, and yet still had bad thoughts in the heart that I couldn't overcome. I had 47 years of that, not fully understanding. It took a long time. Praise God. Colossians chapter 2. In verse 2, it says, Their hearts being encouraged having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. You see, when we actually come to the truth, we become the perfect man. Uh, we become of the same fullness of deity that Christ had, which is Christ himself. It's, that's, that is what the truth. It's kind of what we read earlier. If, if you've been taught the truth, just as the truth is in Christ, just as it is in Christ, look at the life of Christ, in whom all Hid, in, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. For I say this, that no one will deceive you with persuasive arguments. There's all these people who are going to come with persuasive arguments. They'll pick one verse of the Bible and they'll use all these persuasive arguments. Don't be deceived. For even though I absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, just as you have received Christ Jesus, how are you to walk? You to walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in your faith, even as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. That's right. We're to walk just as he did. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the traditions of men, according to elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Just because someone's preaching Christ, just because somebody preaches a, a verse, doesn't mean they know truth. The devil has become skilled in doing that. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made full. He is the head over all rule and authority. And in him, you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And most people don't know what that means. Listen to the episode on Romans chapter 6. 
Listen to the episode on Romans chapter 2. Understand how God defines it, how God contrasts between the old man and the new man, and see if your life matches up. If not, don't de- deceive yourself. Admit that you're still an enemy of God. Amen. I, I would have never guessed in a million years that I was an enemy of God when I, when I claimed to be a Christian and I desired God and all that. People around me would have never have said. As a matter of fact, when I told them that I was never a Christian, people said, no, Sam, don't you're deceiving yourself. That, that's not true. Kyle, you were one of those people initially. Yeah, I, I didn't fully understand. I, I had believed what I had been taught, which is it was a deception. Yeah, and I, actually, I didn't fully understand. I actually had to stop talking to you because you were so convinced. I, I couldn't even get through. Um, and there's many people like that. Praise God. I continued to pray and God touched your heart. And you came around a couple years later. Yep, snatched from the flames. So again, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith and the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And and again, p- most people don't even know what it means to be buried with Christ. They don't know. They don't know what it means to be circumcised with Christ. Listen to the episode we did on Romans chapter 6. God explains it so well. So well. Second Thessalonians. Chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Some more deception. Now we beseech you, brethren, touching the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, to the end that ye be not quickly shaken from your mind, nor yet be troubled, either by spirit or by word, or by epistle as from us, as that the day of the Lord is just at hand. Let no man beguile you in any wise, for it will not be, except the falling away come first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's right. So so here they're talking about, um, you know, 1 Thessalonians talked about, you know, when the rapture would happen at the last trumpet, and, you know, because people were concerned about people having having died. Now here in 2 Thessalonians, they're thinking, oh no, I think we missed it. And he's like, no, 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 you haven't missed it. Don't be deceived, whether by a spirit or a message or a letter, even from us, as if Paul was writing a letter. People were forging letters in his hand. It's like, no, don't listen to any of that. These are all deceivers. And then he tells them that um, the rapture, this gathering or gathering to Christ uh, that he talked about in 1 Thessalonians, he says, uh, you realize it can't happen until the apostasy comes first. The apostasy has to happen. Uh, the man of lawlessness or the Antichrist, the son of destruction, he has to be revealed. We know that doesn't happen until the, the middle point of the tribulation. And yet all these people who are pre-tribs, it's like, how can you possibly have a pre-tribulation rapture when here he's saying, don't be deceived by all these liars, because they were saying it happened pre-pre-trib, like during their time. And it's like, it will not, it cannot until after the tribulation starts, after the apostasy happens, after the man of lawlessness occurs. And as you keep reading, he says that Jesus will come back when he does come back at his revelation, at his coming, he'll actually destroy the man of lawlessness. That's right. Well, that actually happens at the end. And so people want to be contentious in this. Well, you know, I tell people and they say, no, but we aren't subject to the wrath of God. I said, listen, uh, the wrath of God is against the sons of disobedience. The wrath of God came upon his own people uh, who were being disobedient. Those who were true servants, they didn't get the wrath of God. God preserved them. Um, And when you look in the tribulation, the last trumpet happens right before the bull judgments and the wrath of God actually pours out to destroy everybody. Uh, So they are rescued at that point. But everything else, God doesn't say we're going to be freed from the persecution of just man and the general world. He says, no, no, you'll be persecuted. And, and you'll be put to death. But but again, Kyle, people have fragments of knowledge. They don't know the full truth. They don't look at all of Scripture. Uh, let's move on to Timothy. We're going to look to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. More deception, more warnings, more false teaching, these false people. So chapter 1, what does Scripture say? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 through verse 7. As I exhorted you to tarry at Ephesus when I was going into Macedonia, that you might charge certain men not to teach a different doctrine, neither to give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questionings, rather than a dispensation of God which is in faith. So do I now. But the end of the charge is love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and faith unfeigned. And yep, and so he says, some men straying from these things 
have turned aside to fruitless discussions. Now, they want to be teachers of the Bible, even though they do not understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. So people, they want to be teachers of God. These are people who want to go to seminary. They want to be a pastor. They want to teach the things of God. And then when they come from their seminary, they're confident in their teachings. They're confident in their self-puffed up man's knowledge, even though they don't even know the word of God in the Bible. They distort it. They become trained and skilled experts at twisting and corrupting the word of God, hiding the truth, distorting passages, not accurately handling the word of God. Ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. God says, when you don't teach the word of God properly, you teach myths. When you don't teach the word of God according to the spirit of God, you teach traditions of men, taught by men, synagogues of men. It's not according to the administration of God. The goal of our instruction in verse 5 is love from a pure heart. Most people don't even know what it means to have a pure heart. And a good conscience and faith unfeigned. That's right. A sincere faith. Most people don't have a true faith. They don't have a true proof of faith. They don't have the good conscience. The good conscience, as Peter says and others, the good tree, the good tree, the good heart. Nope. Most people don't know. They turn away from those things. They turn aside to fruitless and empty discussions, Kyle. Uh, I tell you, it's it's terrible. Chapter 4. Let me uh, read uh, 8 through 10 just to, to add to that. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, as knowing this, that law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and unruly, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for abusers of themselves with men, for men stealers, for liars, for false swearers, and if there be any other thing contrary to the sound doctrine. That's right. Anything and everything contrary to the truth. And it's all in the heart. People say, oh, I'm not a murderer. Do you have the anger of man? Okay. You murder your brother in your heart. Stop Stop trying to come up with your own definition. God's already defined it. We've covered this. That's right. Uh, and again, the law was made for sinners. It's those who break the law. And we've covered this in, in many other passages. Uh, Galatians, we talked about it. Are you under the law or not under the law? Um, those under the law, those are lawbreakers. You're still a sinner, you're under the law. Well, why is the law not made for a righteous person? Because a righteous person doesn't break the law. Fulfills it. That's right. And then what does it mean to fulfill the law? What does it mean to love God and love your neighbor as yourself? A lot of people don't know what that is. Not to sin against them. That's right. We covered that in the episode of Romans chapter 13. Also, I think James chapter 2, we covered it as well. Those uh, those episodes. Moving over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 3. More warning and caution about deception. What is it? From 1 to 3, But the Spirit saith expressly that in later times some shall fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, through the hypocrisy of men that speak lies, branded in their own conscience as with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God created to be received with thanksgiving by them that believe and know the truth. That's right. So again, God, the Spirit explicitly says that people are going to be deceived. Deceived, even fall away. Paying attention to these deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. You see, anything that's not of the Word of God is a doctrine of demon. Now, the devil preaches the doctrine of demon. You can preach the doctrine of demon by just quoting all Scripture, but half of it. You see, that's what the devil did with Christ. The devil just quoted half Scripture. Do that. Half Scripture, you'll be doing well. You'll be following the doctrines of demons. So people who want to sit there and only plant themselves on one verse or this, and they don't want to examine or adhere or subject themselves or submit to all the word of God, okay then, you're following the doctrine of a demon. You're being just like the demons and the devil. Chapter 6, still in 1 Timothy. More false teaching. These false prophets and teachers. Chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. If any man teacheth a different doctrine, and consenteth not to sound words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is puffed up, knowing nothing, but doting about questionings and disputes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, wranglings of men corrupted in mind and bereft of the truth, supposing that godliness is a way of gain." But godliness with contentment is great gain. 
Yep. So here, again, he's telling us people are going to teach a different doctrine. It's just not with the words that Christ spoke. They'll say some of the words of Christ, but not all the words of Christ. They'll say some of the words of Christ, but then they'll add other words. They'll admit this, add that. Sorry, you can't do that. And you know what they do? They, they have this deathly interest in asking controversial questions and disputes about words. You see, I'll go into people and they just want to hang on one verse. No, but this word says that. No, but this word says that. No, but this word says that. I'm like, okay, well, why don't we stop trying to interpret it using man's foolish wisdom? Let's just back up and expand the aperture and look at the entire chapter. And let's see if God already gives the context of what he meant by how that word should be applied. Let's see if God gives other examples that actually demonstrates what he meant by that statement. Let's look at the whole book and see if that's consistently repeated and applied. And as soon as you do that, all of a sudden people, they start getting knocked off off their balance because you reveal all this other knowledge that the Bible teaches that contradicts the very thing they're trying to hold to. They live in houses built on sand. I tell you, Kyle, it's a tragedy. And I pray people that are listening today wake up and see the danger that is at hand. Now, chapter 6. Verse 20 and 21, Uh, again, additional warning against this false knowledge. O Timothy, guard that which is committed unto thee, turning away from the profane babblings and oppositions of the knowledge which is falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Yeah. Grace be with you. Gone astray from the faith. They've professed and gone astray from the faith because... Some people started going down the right path, and then they got deceived. Unfortunately, some people get deceived from the very get-go. That was me. If I would have just stuck in my Bible and said, God, you teach me, you show me all your word, uh, I would have been so much better. But no, I I put my trust in, in my pastors. I put my trust in what my parents taught me. I put my trust in what was taught at the church. Because, I mean, they had the Bible open. Surely, how could you go wrong? Well, I, w- I didn't realize there's this much deception using the Word of God, claiming to be of God, but false. Second Timothy, more deceptions. Chapter 2, uh, verse 14 through verse 19. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them in the sight of the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, to the subverting of them that hear. You see that, Kyle? arguing about words. You know, if somebody wants to understand the book, people will, again, Kyle, I, I got to say this, people will, will sit there and they'll plant themselves on a single verse. Romans 10, 9, John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, 1 John 1, 8, 1 John 1, 9, 1 John 1, 10. And you ask them, okay, can you tell me the whole book? Give me a summary of the book, please. And they can't. They can't. They're blind. Show me where you think this teaching that you're creating in your own mind, show me where it's taught consistently throughout the Bible. Show me the other books that teach what you think this is teaching. No response, nothing. All they can do is plant themselves on certain words or verses, and they don't know their Bible. Now, we're going through highlighting these things. Kyle, we did a whole episode on the book of, of 1 Timothy. We did an entire episode on the entire book of 2 Timothy. We look at it. I encourage people, listen to it. See if what we go through, as we just simply point out all the things that God already says, where he's consistent in his message. The truth is clear. Keep going. Give due diligence to present thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, handling aright the word of truth. But shun profane babblings, for they will proceed further in ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a gangrene, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. And 19. Howbeit the firm foundation of God standeth having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of the Lord depart from unrighteousness. Yep, or abstain from all wickedness. You don't live in that anymore. That's right. That is the firm foundation of God. You name the name of the Lord? Well, this is the firm foundation of God. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. Everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. You don't live in it anymore. But other people, they have worldly and empty babble or chatter. It only leads to further ungodliness. It can't turn people away because it's not truth. Folks, 
Are you still living in unrighteousness? Do you still have thoughts and lusts in your heart? And you call yourself a Christian? Folks, that's not the way. You're on the wide path. That's a path of destruction. The narrow path is a path of righteousness. It's a straight path. It doesn't deviate from side to side. It's constant and consistent. The only way, the only way that you can live and walk on that path is that the Spirit of God indwells you fully and controls your life. The old man is dead. The new man can walk in righteousness on that path. Amen. And, you know, Kyle, for, for people that are listening to, listen, we, we are available to talk on the phone, to answer your questions in email. Send us an email. Ask you a question. Say, you know, I hear this. I see this. I don't understand. I, 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 it seems like what you're saying is contradicting. Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about your specific question. Let's go to scripture. Let's look at all of it. We can help you with that. Because again, it, the word of God has to be consistent. If, if you think there's contradictions, please point them out and, and we'll address those. And the uh, email address to send questions is questions at warriors, the number four, Christ podcast dot com. That's questions at warriors for Christ podcast dot com. Put the number four in there. And for those that have questions, again, sometimes it might be good. Shoot us an email and, and give your contact. We, we can call you and discuss over the phone. Uh, sometimes it, it's just easier to, to be able to dialogue back and forth. And it's okay to ask one and say, hey, I'm not where you guys are at. I'm trying to understand why you guys are where you're at. Please explain more and, and ask your pointed question. That's okay. I'm not going to be offended by that. You know, I delight in people who are seeking and searching. I understand that everybody starts in darkness. I started in darkness. I thought I was in light and I wasn't. So I understand. I would expect you to have questions. I would have had a million questions for myself, the old man. I Actually, I probably would have never asked because I would have said I'm a Fruit Loop. Um, the new man uh, is a Fruit Loop and I would have paid no attention You know, to my own demise. Praise God, he, he rescued me. So I, 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 I love it when someone actually has a desire to want to know more and is skeptical and say, well, just show me more. You know, please explain it. I, I have these questions. I'm not going to be offended by questions of someone who's seeking. Where the spirit gets provoked in me is when someone doesn't want to go and explore or, or, or look at and see what God says. But yeah, you, you have to ask the questions. You have to reconcile. But but as you're doing that, I pray that you're appealing to God to convict you and guide you by his spirit, to give you eyes to see all the word of God, ears to hear all the word of God. But I would love, you know, because some people may be intimidated, like, oh, he's just going to try to attack me. No, no, no I'm, I'm, that's not me. Where I, where the spirit gets provoked is I've had so many conversations with other pastors and leaders and people who are so stubborn in their heart, they won't even entertain looking at the Word of God. That's what's provoking. God has like zero tolerance for those people. But people who are seeking, well, you're, you're in the seeking phase. You're the infant in Christ. You're, you're coming to the light. You're, you're trying to understand. Oh, I would pour my life into those people, Kyle. I, I love doing that. And we do get questions. We do, we do get them on there. But let's say, uh, say the email address again. It's questions at warriorsforchristpodcast.com. The number four, warriorsforchristpodcast.com. Okay, uh, moving on, 2 Timothy chapter 3, looking at, uh, again, some difficult times that are going to come up. So in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, it says, realize this, in the last days, difficult times will come. It says, men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, unholy, ungrateful, unloving irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good. Again, this is how God sees these people. Most people would say, oh, oh, I am not this person. Well, in a holy, perfect eyes of God with pure light, yeah, this is how God would see, see most people in the church. Treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness. But what do they deny, Kyle? But having denied the power thereof. Now, see, listen to this. We're talk all those things we just read about Kyle is how God would describe the people in the church. Now look around at all the churches people. Would you say that most of the people who are seeking God, they want to do good, they want to delight in the righteousness of God, 
would you say they would describe themselves at that list that we just read? They probably don't think so. No, they'd be like, absolutely, this is not me. But that's because they don't understand how wicked and how God hates sin so much that the thought in the heart is already put you guilty being an idolater, a murderer, a stubborn, a treacherous person. Puffed up. Because you're actually taking the name of God, and yet you're living a lie because you hold to a form of godliness, but you have no power. You never came to the truth. What does the Bible say about such people? For of these are they that creep into houses and take captive silly women laden with sins, led away by diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ah, and that's a sad thing. They're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It says avoid these people. Um, I didn't finish reading the full, uh, was it verse 5? But it says avoid these people. Avoid these people. Yep. They're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. As long as they continue to firmly sit planted in what their doctrine and dogma, they're never, ever going to come to the truth. Second Timothy uh, verse, still in chapter 3, it, it says, read verse 12 and 13. 12 and 13. Yea, and all that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So see, these people in the church, these false teachers, these people who hold a form of godliness but have no power, they're deceiving others while they themselves are deceived. But he tells us, you, however, continue in the things which you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings. Well, what were the sacred writings during that time, Kyle? That would be the whole, the Tanakh. The Old Testament. The Old Testament. The Old Testament, the sacred writings, and the Old Testament is able to give you what? Wisdom unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Christ. And, you know, we've talked about this. We've covered it in the episodes, you know, is your faith based upon truth or lies? We've covered it in the book of Hebrews. Um, The same gospel that was spoken to Israel, the same gospel that Moses spoke, is the same gospel today. It's not a different gospel. It's no different. But people don't understand that. They try to say it's all different. No, it's not. It's not different. Chapter 4 verse 3 through 4. Another warning. For the time will come when they will not endure the sound doctrine, but, having itching ears, will heap to themselves teachers after their own lusts, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and turn aside unto fables. They'll turn aside to fables, to myths, to the teaching of men. Ears wanting their ears to be tickled. Kyle, this is what happens. This is the warnings that God gives of the church, all this de- deception, and, and most people are just unaware. They're, they're blind to all these warnings. What are some things that in, in the things that you've heard in the past that you would call teachings that, having itch, that, uh, that tickle the ears? Well, one of the biggest ones is just the comfort of knowing that Oh, I'm always going to to struggle with some form of sin. I can never be perfect. I'm always... Because, right, if you think you're a Christian, but yet you're confessing your sins every night, well, for somebody to come along and say that, well, then you aren't a Christian, I mean, that, that's like the worst possible thing. That that undermines your entire life. That undermines. It basically says you have an eternal decree of hell against you. And that's probably the biggest thing. That's that's one of the things that's discussed in Jeremiah chapter 23, the false prophets, the false teachers. He says these are false, they're teachers. You see, they they continue to allow you to, to have sin in your life. They actually strengthen your hands because they justify and say that you still have peace with God, even though you still have sin in your life. And, and God says, no, you see, if these people stood in my counsel, if they heard my words, then they would proclaim and tell the people that they still have sin in their life and that they have to repent. Just as God says, it's not that my hand is so short to save, but you guys continue and you won't let me fully cleanse you of all your sin. You continue to, to have this sin. And, and Isaiah has so much truth in it. We did an episode on the book of Isaiah. It, please, I pray, people, if, if you have not listened to that episode on the book of Isaiah, please listen to the episode on the book of Isaiah. Listen to what God says. A lot of the prophecies of Christ come right out of that. How do you get your sins white as snow? white like wool. How, how does that happen? God says he wants to reason. He wants to plead with you. Listen to the plea that God communicates in the book of Isaiah. 
I, I don't know what else to say, Kyle. All I can do is point people to the truth and beg and plead that they read all the word of God. Amen. Titus chapter 1. Looking at, so it starts off in verse 9. We just He just talked about overseers or elders and what they're supposed to do. And in verse 9, it says they're to hold fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with teaching, true teaching, so that these elders will be able to both exhort and sound doctrine and refute those who are contradicting the truth. What does it say about these people who are contradicting the truth in verse 10 through 16? For there are many unruly men, vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, men who overthrow whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars. Evil beasts, idle gluttons. This testimony is true. For which cause reprove them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. Now, up to that point, Kyle, you're probably like sitting there going, okay, yeah, these people that they're talking about, they do not know God. The, this must be like wicked, wicked people of the world. Oh, they're Cretans. Well, but what does it say about these people in verse 16? Do these people consider themselves not a people of God? They profess that they know God. They profess to know God. But by their works, they deny him. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Yeah, and the word is actually disqualified. They're disqualified for any good deed. The reason why they're disqualified is they aren't pure. See, verse 15, to the pure all things are pure. But the woes who aren't, who are still defiled, where's the defilement? It's in their mind, their conscience. That's the heart. That's what's defiled. It's the bad thoughts. And, and that's how God sees it. But you see, they, don't, they aren't sound in the truth. No, they pay attention to teachings of men. Teachings of men. The problem is, Kyle, teachings of men turn away from the truth. Teachings of men turn away from the truth, but they confess to know God. And again, people say, oh, but I'm not that person. Trust me. That's how God sees the person. But by their works, they deny him. Yeah. God says that man, when they look at man, looks at man and they evaluate themselves in the wisdom of man, they say, oh, wow, that's a righteous person. And God looks at that person and says, you call that a righteous person? That person is full of death, decay, and dead man's bones and is an enemy of, is, is an enemy of all righteousness. And so I tell you, I said, you, got to, you have to completely let God transform and renew your mind by his word and his spirit and stop holding on to what you think is right or you'll never find truth. But those who have, praise God. I pray that this is just reinforcing the truth that God has already shown you. Second Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at more false teachers. What verse, brother? Uh, Kyle, if you can read verse 1 through 3. Okay. But there arose false prophets also among the people, as among you also there shall be false teachers, who shall privily bring in destructive heresies, denying even the master that bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their lascivious doings by reason of whom the way of the truth shall be evil spoken of. Yep, blasphemed. The way of the truth will be blasphemed. And in covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose sentence now from old lingereth not, and their destruction slumbereth not. Yep, and their greed they'll exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. Now, and you're like, okay, well... He actually gives us some insight of what this false teaching is, what these destructive heresies, what these blasphemes are. Now, he gives us insight, doesn't tell us exactly what they were saying, but it gives the rebuttal to it. You see, people in many of the churches today, Kyle, will sit there and say, well, you're always going to have some sin. You cannot be free of sin. You're always going to have some sin. What does God say about the angels when they sinned in verse 4? For if God spared not angels when they sinned, but cast them down to hell and committed them to pits of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Oh. And so so they're cast down, the angels, when they sinned, they, they didn't get light. 
They got darkness. They got the pit of hell. Well, Kyle, what about the ancient world when they continued to live ungodly? What did God do to them? Did he spare them? Oh, and spared not the ancient world, but preserved Noah with seven others, a preacher of righteousness. When he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, having made them an example unto those that should live ungodly. That's right. And again, we don't decide or dictate in our judgment or our mind what's ungodly or what's godly. God has already defined that. We are to make determinations and judgments as God has defined who is righteous and who is not, who's the sinner, who's been free, who isn't continue to live in sin. God defines that. It's his ways, not our ways. Now, our ways are to be his ways when those who become sons of light, and then we're to proclaim, we're to judge, and to speak and proclaim just as God has declared, just as Christ was obedient and walked in the same manner, that we are then to follow in his steps. So he sums it up, Kyle. What does he say in verse 9? The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment unto the day of judgment. That's right. And all this is how God defines who a righteous man is. People say, oh, but I'm a righteous man. I, I, I'm, I'm considered righteous now because I believe in Christ. Okay, listen to the episode of, of Would God Consider You Righteous? Listen to it. We, we lay out the Word of God. Go listen to it and see if that's you. Listen to what the true grace of God is. Did the true grace of God, are you actually walking in the grace of God? Go listen to the episode. See if, if God would agree with you. As you continue here in 2 Peter, talking about these false teachers, in verse 12, he says, They're like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct, instinct to be captured and killed. <laughs> they, they speak or revile where they have no knowledge. Now, they think they have knowledge, but he says, They will, in the destruction of these creatures, also be destroyed. He says they're going to be destroyed. They have no knowledge. They're going to suffer or receive the wages of unrighteousness for which they have done. They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. Their stains, blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they feast with you. That's right. They go to the feast. They go to the celebrations of God. They go to your church gatherings, and you don't even know they're there. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. They can't stop sinning. Enticing unsteadfast, unsteadfast souls, having a heart exercised in covetousness, children of cursing, forsaking the right way, they went astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the hire of wrongdoing. Yep, and most people don't understand the story of Balaam. We did a st we we covered all this in detail in the episode we did on Second Peter. Listen to that. We take you back to Numbers chapter twenty three and twenty two, where where this is discussed. Um, and as you keep reading through in verse seventeen, he says these people are springs without water. They look like they have water. They look like a spring. No water comes out. Oh, they look like a storm that's going to bring nice rain. No rain. But no rain. These people are, are whom the black darkness has been reserved. They speak arrogant, arrogantly. That's how God would say they do it. Uh, they have empty words. They entice by fleshly desires, sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in, who live in error. Do they promise them something, Kyle, in verse they, 19? They promise them liberty. They promise them freedom. But do they have freedom? No, they are bondservants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he also brought into bondage. Now, some of these people had actually previously escaped something. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but then they went back, they are again entangled therein and overcome, and the last state has become worse with them than the first. Does it say they had known the way of righteousness? It were better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than, after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So in God's eyes, knowing the end from the beginning, he knew that they were what type of people from the beginning? These were people, at, as has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog turning to his own vomit again, and the sow that had washed to wallowing in the mire. Yep. Uh, flipping over to Jude. Jude, verse 4 and 5. Jude, verse 4 and 5. For there are certain men crept in privily, even they who were of old written of beforehand unto this condemnation, ungodly men, 
turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And verse 5. Now I desire to put you in remembrance, though ye know all things once for all, that the Lord, having saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And so here, and again, he actually repeats, then he repeats about the angels, he repeats about Sodom and Gomorrah, almost like the same thing that uh, we just read in, in, um, in Peter about those who deny the master. Yep. Uh, those who d- profess to know God but but not, but deny him by their deeds in Titus. People will say they know God, but the problem is you deny him. When you sit there and think that you can continue to have, oh, but it's just you know a white lie, or I did this, or yeah, I still have sinful thoughts, but I'm not acting them out. Okay, you you deny God. You you think that you can have peace with God and you still live in sin. You think the grace of God effectively you're, you're taking the license and the liberty to say that that you can still do that and have peace with God. God says no, no, you can't. You don't know the grace of God. They don't know. He says these people have crept in unnoticed. Uh, they're unnoticed, but God says they've already been marked for condemnation. They turn the grace of God into licentiousness. And and now, think about that. If you had somebody that came into church and said, hey, hey, we can just live it up and go and sin and sin and sin, and we have grace, and so let's just sin all the more so that grace may increase, ha, 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 ha. Would that person stand out as a hidden person or an unnoticed, or would they stand out like a sore thumb? They should stand out like a sore thumb. <laughs> they would. And, and and here's the key, Kyle. I, I Remember all those false churches I used to go to? They would say, by no means am I saying that we can continue to sin. No, no, absolutely not. But we aren't trying to sin. You don't want to sin. Your attitude is you don't want to sin. But we're, we're, we aren't perfect. No one's perfect. We're always going to have some sin. That's what I mean. These are the liars. These are the ones that have crept in through deception and deceit. They turn the grace of God into licentiousness. And teachings that are it that tickle the ears. Because they don't know the truth. They don't under, understand what it means to be free and the power of God, all the fullness of God. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. Again, does Jesus warn about the false people? He does. What does he say to the church of Ephesus in verse 2? I know thy works, and thy toil and patience, and that thou canst not bear evil men, and didst try them that call themselves apostles, and they are not, and didst find them false. So they found them to be false. They had to challenge and put to test these apostles. Again, apostles, apostles of Christ. No, you're false. So those were the passages that I had that talked about false teaching false teachers. Kyle, there's a lot of warnings. There is. Now we're going to look at sin. You cannot be deceived by sin. Let's flip back to 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse, verse 9 through 11. Or know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with men, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And he says, but such were some of you. And see, the problem in the Corinthian church is not everybody had been cleansed. Um, we read that earlier. We've covered some of the book of 1 Corinthians. We haven't gone through all of it, but in the episode that we did do through the first three chapters, go listen to it and you'll find out not everybody in the Corinthian church was truly a saint of God, one who had been born again. Some of them were, but not all of them. The ones who had been changed, they no longer are that old person. They no longer have the sin in their life. It doesn't matter what it was. It's been cleansed. It's been removed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, with respect to sin and deception, what does he say? Actually, I'll I'll read that one because many translations get it wrong. Okay. And I've been reading from the ASV, folks. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and looking at verse 33 through 34, he says, stop being deceived, imperative command, stop being deceived. It's not do not be deceived. They were already deceived. Stop being deceived. Now, this is to the people that were being deceived. Earlier, we talked about people who said they had a faith, um, but they said there was no resurrection. Right? Different people had different faiths that couldn't save. Now he's at the end. He says, stop being deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. 
awake to righteousness. Because many of them were still, had not awakened righteousness. They're still in darkness. Awake to righteousness and stop sinning. Well, they hadn't awoken to righteousness. Some of them still struggle with sin. They hadn't escaped. Did they have knowledge of God? For some have no knowledge of God. They had no knowledge of God. Now, if they had no knowledge of God, then obviously you'd say, well, then obviously how could they have a faith in God that results in salvation if they had no knowledge of God? How could they have any knowledge of God if they're still in darkness? Well, they had to awake to righteousness. Stop being deceived. But yet they thought they had a faith. They were in the Christian church. Stop being deceived. Awake to righteousness. Stop sinning. Some of you have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. They didn't know, Kyle. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 3 through 9. For if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each man prove his own work, and then shall he have his glorying in regard of himself alone, and not of his neighbor. For each man shall bear his own burden. Uh, yep, through verse 9. Through 9, okay, sorry. But let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth unto his own flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth unto the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So, we will reap if we do if, not grow weary, if, if we, faint we not. do not grow weary, and we'll only reap eternal life if we're sowing to the Spirit. That's right. He says, don't be deceived. God's not going to be mocked. You will receive what you sow. And you're like, oh, okay. So what exactly is he talking about? Well, you have to be reaping to the Spirit. You can't be reaping to the flesh. Flesh, eternal death. Spirit, eternal life. Well, what's the difference? Well, if you back up in chapter 5, he talks about being free now. We're free. Verse 13, you are called to freedom. Don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. He then tells us that we're to walk a certain way, and if we walk a certain way, we aren't going to sin. What's the way we're supposed to walk in verse 16? But I say, walk by the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Tells us in verse 17, because they're opposites. You see, the Spirit is, is opposite the flesh. If you're in the Spirit, you won't do the flesh. If you're in the flesh, you aren't going to do the Spirit. They're opposites. They are opposites. You can't do both. Don't be deceived. Bad fruit, good tree doesn't bear bad, bad fruit. It only bears good, and a bad tree cannot bear good because good is the spirit. The bad tree, the bad heart who hasn't been circumcised still has the evil thoughts that defile it. So he says, he tells us that if you're walking by the spirit... You are not under the law. You're not under the law. That's verse 18. So that's how we escape from the law. You have to be able to walk by the Spirit. Only if you have the Spirit, most people don't receive it because they come to God in a faith that's not truth. They come into a half-truth. That was me way back. Now he says, if you have any of these flesh, he's going to tell. Here's a list of all the deeds of the flesh. Remember, in the eyes of God. Now, I, I want to point out something. We, we covered this a long time ago. Um, uh, Saul. Saul was accused by God. He says, um, to not obey the voice of God is the same as rebellion divination, and idolatry. You don't obey the voice of God, you're an idolater. And there's many other things that he accuses of idolatry. You like the pleasures of the world, you put the God, you know, second fiddle to the world, and you get caught up in the busyness or the complacency of life. That's also idolatry. There's many things that fall into idolatry, but simply not obeying the voice of God. There you go. All the people who don't obey the truth, you are an idolater. So, what are some of the things? If you do any of these things... Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousies, wraths, factions, divisions, parties, envyings, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I forewarn you, even as I did forewarn you, that they who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And it's those who do such things. And, and we covered this, uh, I think it was the episode of righteousness that we looked at, when God call you righteous. That word practice, it, it's actually simply you commit, you perform, you do. do. Yeah. Um, doctor practices medicine. He does medicine. Yeah. It's, it's, 
It's not this habitual practice or any of that. Uh, do you have any of that in your life? And it all it's, it's really in your thoughts. You see, the sin is in the thought, um, and as God would define it. Okay, then, then you still struggle. Then you are that person. You have the deeds of flesh. But those of the Spirit, does the Spirit produce any of those things, Kyle, no. in verse 22? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Oh, there's no law against those things because it doesn't break the law. And those who belong to Christ, what have they done in verse 24? They have crucified the flesh with the passions and the lusts thereof. That's right. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 through 10. Some more. Don't be deceived. In, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, people say, what does it mean to be a son of disobedience? We'll get to that. We're going to back up and go back to chapter 2, where he tells us what a son of disobedience is, basically before you receive the Spirit of God. Whatever life you lived. So let me give you an example of what my life looked like when I was a son of disobedience, Kyle. I went to church every Sunday. I had faith in God that it was by his grace and his grace alone that I was, I was saved and redeemed through the blood of the Lamb. Kyle, I delighted in reading the Word of God. I delighted to tell other people about Christ. I delighted in the time that I got to spend leading men's Bible studies. I spent much of my time devoted to serving God and serving in the church. I did not go around in cursing. Kyle, you would never find a single curse word that ever came out of my mouth. I didn't go around and get drunk in bars. Not once. Kyle, I didn't spend time running around with people with bad behavior, as I thought in my mind. I didn't do any of those things. Did I struggle with some sins in my heart and in my mind? And maybe occasionally outward, uh, you know, look at something that I wasn't supposed to. And then I thought I was overcoming because I went months and months and ye over years not looking at it. And I thought I was being sanctified. Yep, that was me. A man who other people said was a godly, godly man. Kyle, I was a son of disobedience. The sin that ruled and reigned in my life was the battles of the thoughts that I would have in my heart because I still had a bad heart. Sin still dwelled in my heart, even though I had all the desires of wanting to do good. And in my mind, thought, thought I was doing good, but God rejected me because I was still the bad tree. You were an infant. I was an infant. I, I was the infant in Christ. I had not yet received the, spirit, power, the spirit of God. I had not yet received all the fullness of the deity. I had not yet been fully cleansed from all unrighteousness. I had not been made strong by the spirit of God and set free. I was the infant convicted by the things of God and desperately desiring to draw closer to God each day and lead other people into what I thought was freedom with Christ. I was a son of disobedience, Kyle. That's an example. That's one example. You could also turn to another example of somebody who went out and was a mass murderer. They were a son of disobedience. Well, God would say, okay, Sam, you had an anger of man that popped up in your heart that's no different than his. You just exercise self-control because of your, your knowledge of God and your fear of God and your desire of wanting to do good, even though you still had sin that you carried around your heart because your heart hadn't been cleansed. And that's what people don't understand, Kyle. That Brent begs the question to the listeners. Is that is that an example of how you may have lived your life or you're living your life right now? Did you or do you continue to struggle with those same things that Sam said? If so, you're no different. You are still a son of disobedience. And this this episode is for you. Yep. Yeah. Because again, Kyle, I, I, it, it was, it's what's in the heart. That's how God sees us. Sin is sin. Iniquity is iniquity. Darkness is darkness. There can be no darkness and light. For ye were once darkness, but are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is well-pleasing unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather... Reprove them. Yep. And that's that's the truth. For the things which are done by them in secret, it is a shame even to think of. Now, going back to Ephesians. Speak of, sorry. Yep. In Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about we formerly lived this way. In chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, what does it say? And you did, and you did he make alive when you were dead through your trespasses and sin, wherein you once walked according to the course of this world? Once walked according to the prince of the powers of the air, of the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. 
You see, that's how we all lived. We used to live that way. So it doesn't matter to what degree outwardly a man and the ways of man would have identified you as a sinner or a righteous man. In the eyes of God, you're all the same. Sin is sin. The corruption lies in the heart. Verse 3, among whom we also all once lived in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. That's right. And that's what God says. That is what God says. Now, flipping over to Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 6 through 10, it says, For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Kyle, does it say that they were still living and walking in those things? No, wherein you once also walked. When you lived in these things. So when they lived in the, those things, they used to walk that way. And verse 8, he says, but now you must put them all aside. What are all the things that they cannot have in their life anymore? Anger, wrath, malice, railing, shameful speaking out of your mouth. That's right. And he goes on to say, and he says, stop lying to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old man with his doings and have put on the new man that is being renewed unto knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there cannot be Greek and Jew, circum and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bondman, freeman, but Christ is all and in all. And so again, the question goes back to, do you still have some of those things in your life? Do you have anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech? Okay, stop lying. Stop lying. Those things have to be put aside. You have to put on the new self. They're two different creations. One is old, one is new. One's in dark, one's in light. One has bad fruit, one has good fruit. One's, one's cold, one's hot. One's bitter, one's fresh. It, it, it's, you cannot have both. One is crucified, one is resurrected. That's right. Uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 3 some more warnings about deception. And again, what we're talking about, it's a sin. The deception is the sin, whether or not sin still dwells and lives within you, or whether or not it's been put to death and it no longer appears in your members. You know, that's Romans chapter 6 and 7 talk about that, and chapter 8. So in Hebrews chapter 3, uh, we know, unfortunately, many of Il uh, Israel it talks about they were destroyed, and they were destroyed because of sin. So in verse 12, it says, Take care then, brethren, that there be not any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. What does he warn them about the deceitfulness in verse 13? But exhort one another day by day, so as long as it is called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's right. And, and who were the ones that uh, God destroyed in verse 17? Verse 17. And with whom was he displeased forty years? Was it not with them that sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And so why were they not able to enter? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that were disobedient? So disobedient. You continue in sin because you can't overcome because you don't have the power of God, which is a free gift, which enables you to be free so you don't continue to live in sin. But if you still continue to live in sin and you're disobedient, God calls that disobedient what in verse 19? In verse 19. And we see that they were not able to enter in because of unbelief. You still continue to sin. You still struggle. You can say you believe. Your belief is unbelief. Again, we cover what true belief is and. You must believe and receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's turn to the book of James. James we've chapter... done an, and we've done an ep ent entire episodes on the books and the book of James and all the chapters. We have. Which, which one? James chapter 1. So in verse 16, he says, Stop being deceived, my beloved brethren. Stop being deceived. Now, he talked about proof of faith earlier and whether or not they were the perfect man having uh, endurance with a proof of faith, so they'd be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Um, and now he's talking to a different group of people, and he says, stop being deceived. And he tells them, what type of gifts does God give in verse 17? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with, with whom can be no variation. So God only gives perfect gifts. And he gives perfect gifts so that in accordance with the word of truth, we might become what? In verse 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. 
But what happens if... Sorry, of his creatures. That's right. What happens if someone still has the anger of man? Um, how do they stand with God in verse 20? For the wrath of man worketh not to the righteousness of God. The anger of man cannot achieve the righteousness of God. So he tells them they must put aside what? All filthiness and overflowing of wickedness. So they must put aside all this filthiness and all this wickedness. And then he commands them in humility, it must be in humility, they must receive something. What are they commanded to receive? Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Oh, look at that, Kyle. The people hadn't received the word of God, which is able to save their souls. They're still being deceived. They don't understand. They think they had become the new man. They think they have fellowship with God. He calls them brethren. Doesn't matter. They're deceived. They had not received the perfect gift. They don't understand what the perfect gift does. They still had the anger of man in them. They think that that's okay. Nope. If you have the anger of man, you 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 don't know God. You have to put aside all the filthiness and evil because you still have a defiled heart. You have to receive the word implanted, which is able to save their soul. Then he tells them they must become something and stop being another. What does he say about that in verse 22? What must they become? But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deluding your own selves. That's right. You see, those who are hearers and not doers are deceived. They're deceived. And yes, he uses the word logos for the word that we use here, English word. That's Greek, logos. Mm -hmm. And as you keep going on, he talks about people who are deceived in their own heart. Who are those that are deceived in their own heart in verse 26? Verse 26. And if... Any man thinketh himself to be religious, while he bridleth not his tongue, but deceives his heart. This man's religion is vain. It's vain. It's empty. You see you see all these deceptions and these warnings that we're talking about, Kyle? And yet, Kyle, I used to have um, James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 memorized. I would say that to myself when I would get anger in my heart. I would say that so I wouldn't have any outward anger, even though I had the anger inward. And I was deceiving myself, Kyle. I didn't realize that I'm already deceived in the heart. You see, the thought of the anger of man, you've already committed murder, as Jesus taught. And and these are the deceptions that I thought I, I was taught. And I continued to run with because I was such a blind fool. And praise God, he opened my eyes and freed me from all those things by which I could not be freed from because I had never received the Holy Spirit and been born again. Sin still lived in my heart, Kyle. That's what people can't comprehend. But I have a desire for God. I have a desire for God. Go listen to Isaiah chapter 58. Go listen to the episode we did on Isaiah. You'll identify with that person. That person, if they don't change, as God says, declare with a trumpet my people their sins. Even though they were that person that desired and longed for God and prayed and fasted and all those other things. He's like, yep, they're going to be destroyed. Because they wouldn't humble themselves. Verse 25, But he that looketh into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and so continueth, being not a hearer that forgetteth, but a doer that worketh, this man shall be blessed in his doing. Yep. Uh, Chapter 3, verse 2, he talks about, we all stumble in many ways. Well, that's one group of people. Then he talks about, in the second half of the verse, if someone does not stumble... And what he says, he's what? A perfect man, able to bridle the whole body also. Oh, so here's the man who's not deceived in his heart. He's able to bridle not just the tongue, but the entire body. Yeah. You see... He received a perfect gift. That's right. The people who haven't received the perfect gift yet, who still have the bad heart, and out of the heart comes forth through the mouth, um, he tells us, what what about the tongue in verse 6? Verse 6. And the tongue is a fire. The world of iniquity among our members is the tongue which defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the wheel of nature and is set on fire by hell. Hmm. Does it say anybody can tame the tongue in verse 8? In verse 8, But the tongue can no man tame. It is a restless evil. It is full of deadly poison. That's right. No man can tame the tongue. An untamed tongue will both bless God, in verse 9, and will curse men who've been made in his image. That's the untamed tongue. Whether you do it outwardly or inwardly. I never cursed outwardly. But I, I, I did inwardly, um, just in my heart, being angry at people. And, and yet, that's not from God. Can from the same mouth come forth both blessing and cursing? May it never be. No. Can a, can a fountain send from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Or a fig produce olives or vine uh, figs? No. 
and salt water cannot produce fresh. So the problem, Kyle, is there's two types of wisdom. There's the demonic wisdom, the wisdom of the world, and there's the wisdom from above, which is from God. These people were still stuck in the demonic wisdom. So he asks them a question. What's the question he asked them in verse 13? Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by his good life his works in meekness of wisdom. But what if I have some jealousy or selfish ambition in my heart? But if you have bitter jealousy and faction in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. You mean I'm lying against the truth? This wisdom is not a wisdom that cometh down from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. You mean that's demonic wisdom? For where jealousy and faction are, there is confusion in every vile deed. You mean if I just have a little jealousy or selfish ambition, I'm accused of having every single form of evil? You bet. Because it's in the heart, Kyle. That's right. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without variance, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace for them that make peace. Amen. You know, that's, that's truth, Kyle. That is truth. And yet, but it talks about again, it says, What's the source of quarrels and conflicts amongst you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? And, and see, that's the thing. People lust. They don't have, so they commit murder. Now, they may not commit physical murder, but they have anger. Anger produces, right, quarrels. What do you think a quarrel is? It's anger. You didn't get what you want, so you fight in your quarrel. Um... All, all these things is from the heart. You don't have because you don't ask. You ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. What does God say about these people in verse 4? They're adulteresses. Ye adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. It's hostility towards God. So if someone wants to make a friend of, make themselves a friend of the world, what does God say about them? They make himself an enemy of God. An enemy of God. And what does God jealously want in verse 5? Or think ye that the scripture speaketh in vain... Doth the spirit which he made to do, doth the spirit which he made to dwell in us long unto envying? So he jealously desires the spirit he has made to dwell in us. That's, That's right. what God wants to happen. The problem is people are proudful, Kyle. Uh, they don't want to accept this truth. What does God say about these prideful people? Yeah, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So he tells them, they must submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from them. They must draw near to God, he will draw near to them. They must cleanse their hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, mourn, and weep. Turn your la laughter into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. But people, Kyle, Kyle they just don't want to humble themselves. They don't want to humble themselves. People ask, you know, they, they're... That, that haven't been baptized in the Spirit. You know, how do, how do I do that? How do I, how do I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Folks, it's right here. It starts in verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Accept the true message of Christ, that He's forgiven your sins. And accept the Spirit. Allow Him to fill you. Let Him lead your life. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. That's a humility there. Be broken down to the very bottom. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and then he will exalt you. And, and Kyle, Kyle, one of the key pieces is this. It's really difficult for somebody who thinks they're already a Christian, because I've talked to people who already thought they're a Christian. They say, okay, let, let me you know, ask you know, and pray for the Spirit of God. I just need the Spirit of God. And I said, well, where would you go if you died today? And they're like, well, to heaven. I was like, okay, here's what you aren't understanding. The Spirit of God, you see, it, it frees us. You, you don't have peace with God right now. This isn't a, I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven. I just want the Spirit of God so I can be more free. You, are, you aren't free. You're still a slave of sin. Until you recognize and come to the conclusion that you are destined to hell, that unless God changes your heart to that new man so that you can be free, you only have one path. It's hell. That's right. And that's why you should be mourning. And, and, and that's, that's when you mourn. You weep. You, don't, you, you, you get on your knees. You, you realize that your life is done. Eternally, you have a decree of hell against you. When you come to that realization that you don't have peace with God, you are an absolute enemy of God, you're still in darkness, then come in that humility and be willing to give up everything. That's right. Then God does it in faith. He does it in faith, and he changes you so you can live a different life. Be that new creation. 
people, they, they don't understand. You don't get to pick and choose or cling to certain truths or not want to admit something or that. You have to be wholly surrendered to God's truth and what he says about you and his power and what he promises to do through faith. First Peter chapter 3, he says in verse 8, to sum it up, all of you be of one mind, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. Are we to return evil for evil? Not rendering evil for re evil or reviling for reviling, but contrarywise, blessing. For hereunto ye were called, that you should inherit a blessing. God wants to give a blessing, but the one who desires to, to um, love life and to see good days, he must keep his tongue from what? His tongue from evil, and his lips, that they shall speak no guile. Can he still have evil in his life? And let him turn away from evil and do good. You mean we're supposed to do good and not do evil? Not like the man in Romans chapter 7 that does no good, but only does the thing that he hates. Right. Because sin still from... dwells in his heart because it hasn't been cleansed and circumcised. That's right. We're not to do that. Let him seek peace and pursue it. And we did an episode on what a peacemaker is, Kyle. It's not the peace of the world. It's the peace, peace of with God. God. Yeah. Are you a reconciled? Do you create peace of man or do you create peace of God? If you don't understand what I'm talking about, you have to listen to that episode. It's really clear. And God is, a, is for who and against who? For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears unto their supplication. But the face of the Lord is upon them that do evil. That's right. Uh, flipping over to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. Some more people who are deceived. Now, some people are going to, you know, be like, oh, he finally said it. I'm gonna, we're going to go right to verse 8. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Kyle, who does he say this? He talks about somebody who's deceived and the truth is not in him. Who is that person in verse 8? Sorry, I was uh, in the wrong book. All right. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, see, most people are saying, okay, Sam, right there, you are a fraud. That verse exposes you. And then in verse 9 or 10, what does verse 10 say? Verse 10? Mm -hmm. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. People be like, Sam, you are a liar and a deceiver. Look at this. You say that we aren't to be living with sin that we're to be cleansed of all sin, right there it says, if you say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself. The truth is not in you. You are a liar. Now, you know what I'd say, Kyle? i say, well, okay, let's, let's get context of that. Is he talking about a man of God, or is he talking about a wicked man? You see, in passages of the Bible, it talks about those that are in darkness, there's no righteous, no, not one. But those that are in light, he says they're righteous, they do no evil, and they'll abide in the dwelling of God. So if you jump to one passage, it says there's none righteous. If you jump to another passage, it says there's only those that are righteous. If you look to one and he says, if you're a, dark, a man in darkness and you claim to be in light, he says you're a liar. If you're a man in light and you, you say you have darkness, well, that can't be either. So I always ask, which person are we talking about? Because they're opposites and they have opposite meaning. So... How do we know which person we're talking about? Kyle, you got to read more of the book. Yeah, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and, the, and do not the truth. Well, but I'm going to back up even more than that. Yeah. In verse 3, who is he actually writing to? Now, he's writing to a church, yeah. but there's different people in a church. Who's the first group he's writing to in verse 3? That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you may also have fellowship with us. So yet... that you might have fellowship with us. Kyle, you mean they didn't have fellowship? They didn't have fellowship. Did John have fellowship? Yes, John did. What does he say about John's fellowship in verse 3? That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you also, that you may have fellowship with us, yea, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That's right. He says, so that you too might have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father, and it is with his Son, Jesus Christ. John had fellowship. Unfortunately, some of these people in the church did not have fellowship. So he has to point out why they don't have fellowship. Well, the first thing he has to establish is what is truth? What is the message that Christ proclaimed? And, what is that message? And this is the message which we have heard from him and announce unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. How much darkness? None. So if I abide in God, but I still have darkness, would I be a liar? You'd be a liar. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Oh, so this is one of those problems. These people who think they have fellowship with God, he tells us in verse three, they don't have fellowship. Now he's going to tell us what the problem is. There's no darkness in God. 
God is pure light. But these people who say they have fellowship, but they don't, they don't because they still have what, Kyle? They have sin in their lives. They have, they have darkness. darkness. And so God says they're in the truth or they're a liar? They're a liar. Oh, so now we know who the liar is. The liar is the false Christian who claims to be in light when he still has darkness. Now, Jesus taught about this. The one who's in light has no more darkness in him. All the darkness has been removed, circumcised. Sin doesn't dwell in his heart. The evil thoughts aren't there anymore. Are we starting to see what truth is, Kyle? Amen. Amen. And this is what God teaches. And we go comprehensively through so much scripture, Kyle, that shows this in all the different books. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. And notice all these are ifs, 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 ifs. It's yep. all conditional depending on what person you are. If we walk. If you walk in light. Uh, Kyle, what's the standard? As man has light, which he actually has darkness, but he thinks he's in the light and he deceives himself because yep. the light in him is darkness, or a different light? As he is in the light. Oh, as God is in the light. Kyle, how much light darkness did he say God has in verse 5 again? There's none. None. Oh, so if I still have darkness in me, but I claim to be in the light, I'm another liar again. That's right. But if I do walk in the light, is he himself in the light? Do I have fellowship? You do. You have fellowship with him and oh, with one another. And what happened to my sins? They're gone. They're what? Cleansed. 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 Some sin? All. All sin. Uh, oh, so if I'm cleansed of all sin... Then if I were to say that I still had sin, but I don't, then I'd be a liar. But if I still am in darkness and haven't been cleansed of all sin, but say that I have because I think I'm in light. That would make you a liar too. Oh, so he's continuing to talk to those who are liars, who say they have fellowship with God, but still have darkness, who claim to have fellowship, i.e. they've been cleansed from all sin when they haven't. So they come to God and they say they have no sin because they think they've been cleansed from all sin in verse 8, but they haven't. He calls them what again in verse 8? <laughs> A liar and the truth is not in them. A liar because they still don't have the truth. Kyle, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, open the eyes and the minds of those people who are listening to God. Oh, let them show the lies and the deception that they've been deceived their whole life. Oh, Father, let them come to the truth. Let your word go forth like a tidal wave and a tsunami and let it bear and change hearts and lives. Jesus. So what these people have to do, Kyle, they have to get on their knees and confess that they're still a sinner. That's right. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, two things happen. Two things happen. The first thing is what? Well, we have to confess their sins. Yep. And, and the two things that God does. What are the two things that God does? He is faithful and righteous to forgive and to cleanse. So he forgives, and then he cleanses. How much does he cleanse? All. All. All, all unrighteousness. All. All. And then we're commanded to abide and remain in the light and the holy sanctification that God has placed us in. Endure to Not the to end. Not to go back. That's right. Overcome. Endure to the end. To be holy as he is holy in all of our behavior. Not some. All. That's in 1 Peter chapter 1. Folks, we've, we've been talking about this. Trust me, if you have not learned or heard this from where you're going to church, then you might be listening to deceivers. Do not be deceived. Now I want to go to chapter 2. You'll notice in chapter 2, he, he shifts. Now he's writing to his little children. Now, these aren't infants in Christ. This is just a term he's addressing everybody of, of those who are true believers. You see this consistently in, in 2 John. You see it as you keep reading through um, the book of 2 John. In this case, in this application, it's everyone. Now, in here, he says, I'm writing these things to you. He's now writing new things. He's writing new things to this different group of people who are actually children, true children of God, so that they may not, so out of all of you, one of you, a single person may not commit a sin. You know, a lot of these are verb tenses with the sin. If you don't get the verb tenses right, it just says sin, 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 but they're all different sins. Some sins are noun, some sins are verbs, some is to commit, some is to continue. This one is to Commit. Yeah, aorist act of the verb. Commit a sin. If anyone, again, one person, he's writing to everybody. Now he says, if one person, anyone, that's a singular, one person commits a sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, he himself is the payment for our sins, not only for all, but for the whole world. Now, Jesus died for the, whole, the sins of the whole world. Does the whole world get to go to heaven? No. No, only those who've been set free. Now, 
the Bible talks that if you commit a sin, if somehow you've been cleansed and you're living a holy, righteous, godly life with no sin, and somehow through a deception you commit a sin, God doesn't necessarily break you off as a branch. He'll remove it. He won't let you continue in it. And that's why there's all these commands. You go to a brother, you tell him to repent. If he doesn't, you cast him out. Now, you can't do that to somebody who hasn't had the Spirit of God. The sin lives in their heart. It hasn't been cleansed. This is just somebody who the sin has been cleansed. They don't have the thoughts. They don't have any of that. Somehow, a deception got in. If it does, you get it out, and you continue to abide in light. Now, as we continue to look, now speaking to these children who are of the children of God, what truth does he say in verse 3 through verse 6 three through of six. chapter 2. And hereby we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily hath the love of God been perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Just as Christ walked. So Kyle, do you now see that it's shifted? Yep. Chapter one was all those who are deceivers and liars if they say they don't have sin because they hadn't been cleansed. Right. They, now, had, they had no fellowship. Now he's talking to those who are of the truth, and he's saying, if you don't keep the commandments, because now he's speaking to those who are now saying they're of the truth, he says, you're a liar. And that's like, do you walk just as Christ? Okay, then you deceive yourself. You don't know him. If you say you abide in him, you're to walk just as he walked. Now, all of a sudden, it's because he's speaking to a different group of people. It's different instruction, Kyle, of how they know. That's right. You see how simple this is? If you just read the whole thing and keep going. Amen. In verse 9, same chapter. He that saith he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness even now. Okay, that's the one who's deceived. But the other person. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. Oh, no stumbling for him. None, Kyle. Did you see that? That's right. No stumbling? But he that hateth his brother is in the darkness, and walketh in the darkness, and knoweth not whether he goeth, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. His darkness has blinded his eyes. But Kyle, this was the person who says he's in the light. He says he's in the light. Do you see? Do you see? God's trying to help everybody out. People just are so stubborn, they want to just sit there and argue over one verse in 1 John chapter 1, whether 8, 9, or 10, and they don't want to get off of it. I'm like, okay, you're going to die in your stubbornness. You're going to die eternally and be cast into hell because of your stubborn and unrepentant heart. Okay. I don't know what else to say to those people, Kyle. As you keep looking in chapter 2, he then is going to talk in verse 26 through 29, again, about deception. 26 to 29. These things have I written unto you concerning them that would lead you astray. And as for you, the anointing which you received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that anyone teach you. But as his anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is no lie, and even as it taught you, ye abide in him." Abide, continue to abide, as and, the Holy Spirit teaches. And now, my little children, abide in him, that if ye shall be manifested, if he shall be manifested, we may have boldness and not be ashamed before him at his coming. That's right. If you know that he is righteous, you know that every one also that doeth righteousness is begotten of him. If you know he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. If you don't practice righteousness, and he's gonna later say, just as he is righteous then you haven't been born of God. How much light is in God? All light, no darkness. That's right. There's no darkness. And Christ, who is filled with the same light of his, of his Father, the same fullness, how much darkness did Christ produce in him? None. None. You see, this is what people don't understand. And so it even goes there. What are, how much darkness are we supposed to have in us? None. None. Now, chapter 3. In chapter 3, uh, verse 3... He talks about two people. And the first one is who? And every one that hath this hope set on him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. That's right. Are we pure as Jesus is pure? Now, there's another group of people. What's the other person? Every one that doeth sin doeth also lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So, you're either pure and living pure as Christ is pure. Or, or you're a law lawlessness. Or lawlessness. You still have sin. If you do sin, 
then you're still a lawbreaker. Now, Jesus appeared to take away what, Kyle, in verse 5? And ye know that he was manifested to take away sins, and in him is no sin. All right, so Jesus came to take away sin, and what? how much sin again does he say it was in Christ, or how much darkness? There was none. None. So you have the person who's pure, just as Christ is pure, no more sin, uh, and then you have the person who still commits sin, the lawbreaker. Right? Two different people. We're still see John is so good because it distinguishes the two people, just like Romans. That's why I love Romans yep. chapter six, Romans chapter seven, and Romans chapter eight. But you know what people do? They identify themselves with a the sinner in first John chapter one, who's condemned, who hasn't been cleansed, who's the liar, and the truth is not in him. And they also identify that with themselves the other liar and condemned man, which is in the book of John, chapter seven, that we go through the same discussion there. But everyone's blind, blind, blind. They keep identifying themselves with the sinner because that's who they truly are. And then they want to say that the sinner, the condemned man, somehow has peace with God, Kyle. Now, we're going to continue to look at this. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither knoweth him. So the one who abides in Christ sins not. Does not sin. No one who abides in Christ sins. But the person who still sins or still has sin has not seen him and does not know him. That's right, because they haven't been cleansed. Hmm. Um, now he's going to tell us to make sure about a deception. What does he say about deception in, in verse 7? My little children, let no man lead you astray. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that doeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. That's right. If you do righteousness, just as Jesus is righteous, the one who practices or does righteous is righteous just as Jesus. Does our life reflect Christ? Are we pure as he is pure? Do we walk as he walks? Do we abide as he abided? Okay, then you are a proof that you are son of God. But if you still do sin, if you still have sin, Oh, and people say, oh, that's habitually practiced in verse 8. No, that's habitually practiced. I know. You know what I tell people? I say, okay, you want to you be contentious? Go look at Romans chapter 7, the man that you want to be with. Oh, why is it I do that which I don't want to do or practice that's what I want to do? I continue to practice things that I hate. Uh, He's it's not the, same, the perfect man. Kyle, it's the same word. It's the same tense as the man here. And yet they say they're the man of Romans chapter 7, but they say they aren't the man here because this man's more clear because they say this man is a son of the devil. But yet if you keep reading in Romans chapter 7, it says that man's a wretched man. Even though they agree with the law of God, they still have a member of slave of sin in their body, and they're a wretched man. They're condemned. But yet somehow they don't think they have condemnation because they trick themselves. Listen to the episodes we do on those books and those chapters. We go into detail. Verse 9 is pretty much definitive on that. Verse 9, what does it say? Whosoever is begotten of God doeth no sin, because his seed abideth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is begotten of God. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious, Kyle. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. And John chapter 4, verse 20, what does he say? In the, in the Gospel of John? or No, First John. First John chapter 4, verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he hath not seen. That's right. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. And how do we know that we're children of God in chapter 5, verse 2? Hereby we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do his commandments. Do his commandments. Keep his commandments. Are his commandments burdensome? No. No, they're not. What does verse 3 say? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. That's right. They are not burdensome, Kyle. Okay. His burden is light. I want to highlight a couple more things, and we're going to wrap up. Bear with me. I want to just cover a couple passages about the um, the world and the gospel. Uh, for since we're right here in First John, in First John chapter two, verse fifteen and sixteen, it says, "Do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, the lust of the eyes, is not from the world, or it's not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world is passing away in all of its lusts. But the one who is doing the will of God lives forever." There's a deception. There's so many people who chase the world, chase the world, chase the world. It's like, where's God? You, you, you have more world than you do God. Do you not see that that's a problem? 
Do you not see that the love of God is not in you? The love of God is not in you. Little children, it is the last hour, and as ye have heard, that Antichrist cometh. Even now have there arisen many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last hour. Yep. Uh, more about the warnings against the world. In Colossians chapter 3, it talks about our mind, where we're to have our mind set on. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, what does it tell us about our mind? If then ye were raised together with Christ, if, that's an if, seek the things that are, uh, are above where Christ is, seated on the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are upon the earth. For you died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall be manifested, then shall you also with him be manifested in glory. And that's if you've been raised with Christ, if you've died with him. Then we live that way. Our mind is set on the things of God, not on things of this world. The things of this world leads to death. Kind of going backwards through the books now. Uh, Philippians chapter 3. Uh, another one about our mind or our appetite. What is it set on? Uh, what does he say? Well, first he talks about those who are perfect. Let therefore, this is chapter 3, verse 15. Let therefore as many as are perfect. Earlier in um, chapter 12, he says, I have not already become perfect. He's referring to the resurrection of the dead. Uh, we did cover that in one of the previous episodes. So I said, yeah, there's two perfects. The perfect heart when you become born again, and then the second perfect, immortality, the new body, body yep. when you're resurrected from the dead. Um, of course, Paul hasn't become the second perfect, but he all has already become the first perfect, and that's discussed in verse 15. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. If anything, if you have a different attitude, God will reveal, will, will reveal that. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we've obtained. Those who have already become perfect, the first perfect, the new man, the new heart, they're already living in a new way. But... There's a problem. Some other people haven't. What does he say about them in verse uh, 17 to verse 19? Brethren, be imitators together of me, and mark them that so walk, even as ye have us, for an example. For many walk, of whom I told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is perdition, whose God is the belly, and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. That's right. Their mind is still set on the things of the world. Now, again, he's speaking to Christian churches, people who unfortunately are enemies when they think they aren't. Uh, let's flip to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and in verse 18, uh, he says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age, he must first become a fool so that he might become wise. For the wisdom of this world is what? Foolishness with God. For it is written, he that taketh the wise in their craftiness. That's right. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. We must have the wisdom of God, the wisdom of man, the things of this world, where our mind is set, is going to explain, are we really that new man or are we not? Now, Romans chapter 8, some more discussions about that our mind and where our mind is at, and the things of the world versus the things of the Spirit. Uh, he says, those who are according to the flesh, in chapter 8, verse 5, set their mind on what? For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, some people say, well, I do both. Sorry, that's a double-minded. Double-minded people receive nothing from the Lord. They perish. They perish. They perish. Don't don't try to come up with your own doctrine. The Word of God is clear. If you have any questions, give me a call. I'll walk you through it all. I'll show you scripture. Questions at warriorsforchristpodcast.com, the number four. So the mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Uh, verse seven, can the mindset on the flesh please God? Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. It cannot subject itself, and so therefore, does it have pleasing with God in verse eight? And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, if you're if you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, because you see, some people didn't. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, then does he belong to him? 
He does not belong to him. He does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, because it's been crucified, it's dead. But what what has now been made alive in this person? Yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. And that was all discussed in chapter 6, if you haven't listened to these episodes. And as we, as we keep going, then he says, uh, if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we're debtors. We're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Kyle, if we continue to live according to the flesh, what happens? You must die, but if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's right. Verse 13. There you go. So what type of people are we? For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. There you go. That's how you know if you're a son of God. In Matthew chapter 16, poor Peter. Peter, before he received the Holy Spirit... He was just trapped in the world. Remember, listen to the episode we did. Don't be like the disciples Receive the before, before they, they received the, the Holy Spirit. Yep. Two completely different people. Before they had a faith and a belief that could not yet save them. Listen to that episode and your eyes will be enlightened by the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 16, uh, Peter, still before he received the Holy Spirit, what does Jesus, how, what does Jesus call Peter in verse 23? Verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. That's right. He called him Satan. Why? Because his mind. His mind was still on the things of this earth. It then goes on to say in verse 24, he says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Deny. Take up his cross. Follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever's willing to lose his life for my sake will find it. What, does, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of the Father with his angels. And what is he going to do when he comes, Kyle? He will then repay every man according to his deeds. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Uh, real quick, going back, some deception on preaching of a different gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 through 4, what's the warning? For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Again, the warnings. People were receiving a different Christ, a different spirit, and a different gospel. It's the deception, Kyle. They preach a different, but yet they're preaching Christ. They're preaching the spirit of God. They're preaching good news. But Kyle, they're distorting it. Galatians chapter 1. An, again, a warning about uh, a false gospel. In verse 6, he says, I am amazed at how you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. But is it really a different gospel, no, Kyle? which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. They're trying to distort it. What's going to happen to them, Kyle, in verse 8? But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. He is to be accursed. It's, it's not a, a, a pleasant place. There's many other passages that warn about the dangers of riches also that keep you. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Mark chapter uh, 4, verse 19. Luke chapter 12, verse 19 to 21. Luke chapter 16, verse 13, and 1 Timothy chapter 6, 9 through 10. It warns about the riches, the pleasures of the world. Actually can cause people to shipwreck, to pierce themselves uh, through with many griefs, to fall away from their faith. That's in 1 Timothy. Um, and the last thing that we're going to end on is when people, if people are treating you really well in the church and they think highly of you, um, that may not be a good thing. That may not be a good thing. If we go and we look at Luke chapter 4, when Jesus went and spoke to the people, verse. Uh, I'm, I'm going to 
kind of jump around on that one to compress. So I'll, I'll, I'll do that one and I'll, I'll give you the next one. All right. So in Luke chapter 4, Jesus comes. He, he comes into his uh, Galilee and in verse 14, and he comes to, to go speak. And he actually comes to Nazareth. In verse 17, he takes the book of Isaiah and he goes to read it. He reads the, the prophecy in Isaiah. Verse 20, he closed the book. He gives it back. And all the people, their eyes are fixed on him. And in verse 21, he says, Today, Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, of this, how did the people respond to that in verse 22, Kyle? And all were speaking well of him, and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? So they're amazed by and wondering at the words that he spoke, and, and, and the gracious words. And then some of them were like, yeah, but isn't this Joseph's son? Like, you know, they're, they're, they're struggling. They're in a conundrum. So does Jesus speak kindly and try to help them understand. No, he kind of sharply sharply gives them some insulting uh, proverbs. And he said to them, no doubt he will quote this proverb to me, physician heal yourself. Whatever we have heard, whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And then Jesus insults them further, basically saying, you don't receive the prophets of God. What does he say in verse 24? Yeah, and he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. And then he insults them further by talking about how Elijah, when during when the, the sky was shut up for three years and six months, that Elijah only went to a, a, a widow in Sidon, who was like a Gentile, instead of going to a Jewish widow, because again, they were living wicked. And then in verse 27, he, he says that there are many leper, lepers in Israel during Elisha, but did Elisha go to any of them? Nope, none of them were cleaned, but only Naaman the Syrian. Yep, another Gentile. Um, did that make the people feel better when they heard when Jesus spoke truth? No. In verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. So the people of the church, the people who claimed to be servants of God, when a true prophet of God stood in their midst, they were filled with rage. And what did they try to do to him? They got up and drove him out of the city and led him to, to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. They tried to murder him. You see... The worst offenders of true servants of God is the church, the false church, Kyle. Do you know, I'll talk to atheists, and we can have a conversation, and we listen, they talk, and they say, I understand where you're coming from, whatnot, but you know, I, I don't really believe in God. But I go and I talk to people in the false church, oh, Kyle, as soon as I speak the truth, oh, that's blasphemy. You're of the devil. This is not of God. And they get filled with anger and rage, oh, you can see it boiling in their, in their, with inside of them. But yet, you know, Kyle, when I held to my other uh, faith where, yep, you're always going to have some sin you can never overcome, even though you don't want to, it didn't matter if I talked to any, all different types of people who kind of had a different, you know, a different denominational split, this, this, or this. Somehow we all got along together because we all believe in the same Christ. And we didn't call each other sons of the devil or any of this. But now, all of a sudden, I'm preaching the truth. Oh, oh yeah. Because, you know what, Kyle? That's what the truth does. It divides. It separates. It exposes. Uh, Kyle, Luke chapter 6. What is Jesus, uh, what is taught here in verse 22 to 26? Luke 6, 22 to what? 26. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. You see, he's talking about their fathers, the people of Israel who claim to believe in God. He says, that's right. You guys patted the, the lying devils, the false prophets, and you called them the true servants of God. And the true servants of God that were the few. They were killed by them. You persecuted them. You hated them. Kyle, it's the same way today. It is the same way today. You know, you can read it, uh, some other passages, uh, again, that we're going to cover, but it's getting kind of long. I'll just read them off here. I'll put them also in the episode. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15 to 16, that also, again, talks about the same thing. Acts chapter 7, verse 51 to 54, again, the same thing. And, and these are the things that, you know, some people don't want to accept, 
but it's the truth. Father, we thank you for your word, O oh God, and we thank you that you we have so much warnings about the false teachers, the false leaders claiming to be servants of God, but they're false. They teach blasphemous and false words. They do not know the truth. Expose them, Father. They're still deceived. Father, we, we've covered your words, the warnings about the deception, the dangers about the sin. Father, I pray that people are, that are listening today will submit humbly to your word, that your spirit, O oh God, will touch them, open their eyes and their ears, O oh God, and add another soul to the kingdom. Yes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We hope this weekly program helped rekindle your zeal to know, love, and serve Christ day by day. If you enjoyed the program, consider subscribing and sharing with your friends. Thanks for listening.